Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah, Had a good ra- good round of golf today. Best ever. Good for you. Good for you. Yeah. I play pool. Huh? <laughs> I don't golf. That's Paul. My brother plays. Yeah, I know. I know about Paul playing golf. He's down the Cape all the time, though. He's down. Well, now he, he's got a place. They just bought a place in Plymouth. They bought a place in Plymouth? Yeah. Oh, is he? I'm going down there against it uh, the second week in August. Is he going to be there? No, he's he's still with that. He's got this beautiful. He got this condo in Plymouth, right on the water. So he's very very happy. You know where the old White Cliffs place was? Yeah, that's where he got it. Oh, they built those condos in there. That's where he is. That's where he is. We went there to an Armenian something one time. Oh boy, when I was first born with my wife. Jake Camborian used to own that. Oh? When I was a kid, we had camp there. They used to call it Camp Orion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's for all the time. poor kids. <laughs> That's a long time ago. I was about 10. Yeah. <laughs> 10? Long, long time ago. Good evening, ladies. Nice to see you. Good to see all of you. You betcha. Little by little, we're getting everybody on board. Today is me. We're getting Australia connected. CNN is coming on. Hi, everyone. Hi, sweetie. Hello. How are you? Hello. I'm well. Good, good, Hi. good. Where's mom? Oh, no, that's Lena. Lena oh, should Lena. be coming on very soon. She'll be coming on. See what happens when you get old? Don't get, like, don't get old like me. <laughs> too bad too late <laughs> too late huh too late is right too late, too late. okay a couple more minutes yeah Laura's coming as well so she should be coming on very soon okay yeah Is Laura it cold down in Australia it's a bit cold today yes yeah, yeah it, today it is it's getting colder yes Yes. Get your winter season. It's hot up here. Yep. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's, wow. it's about it's 90 here. Yeah, oh, 90 wow. today. Yeah. It's about 19 down in Sydney today. Yeah. I think it's about 19, yes. We got Marsha's coming on. Hi, everyone. Hi, sweetie. Hello, How are you? Brewster. How are you doing, Marsha? I'm good. Still Mr. Brewster, huh? Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> Mr. Some Bean. things don't change. That, does, that doesn't change. That doesn't change. That doesn't My, change. That, I think Paul still calls him Mr. Brewster. Who? Yeah. My brother. I think he still still calls you Mr. Brewster. Yeah, but I, I have a know. class of young people, and they all call me Mr. B. Yeah. Yeah. And I still communicate with them. There's seven of them. I still got them. That's because of there's. Your love then, for teaching. There, then there's one little girl that calls you OG. I know who oh, that is. That's a geez. Do you know what OG means? Dash. Tell me. Oh, Origi- God. Original gangster. Oh. <laughs> Don't forget, girl, I'm a product of the 60s. I, any music after the, after the early 70s, forget about it. I have no clue. <laughs> yeah well then you're still a kid if you're a product of the 60s you're still a kid okay plus baby <laughs> it's yep. more fun when you're a product of the 30s though say what it's more fun when you're a product of the 30s and still yeah. going yeah okay wait just a minute or two longer because i know our australia people have a Bible study with their bishop, their primate. It's at eleven, eleven. Yeah. And 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 if and if they're late, he's going to yell at me. <laughs> so, so I don't want to get Sidvaz on upset with me. Please make sure you give him my love. Okay, see. I will. I will. I will. I will. I miss him. I miss my boy. I miss my friend. <laughs> we had good times together. Yeah. Yeah. Was he here in this diocese? Sorry, yeah. he, he was, was the vicar general. He was the vicar general for many years. 
He yes. was the pastor in Woodwood, Pennsylvania. Oh, hi, Oh, I must know him. Hey, of course you do. Of course you do. Yeah, and uh, then he became the primate in. Oh, hi, Oh, sure. Yeah, hi, Oh, for yeah. God's sake. Yes. Yeah, yeah like now Gazun. I know who he is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. He was in Austria for a while, and then yeah. he became the primate uh, in Australia. He's done good things ever since. Oh, yes. yes. Thank Michael for Zooming for us. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. Michael is the best. Yep. Thank you. Sorry about last week, but I'm here this week. That's okay. We wouldn't be here if you weren't here. That's right. Yeah. That's he's our boy. Right? He's our boy. <laughs> Even though he's from Texas, we won't hold that against him. Uh, okay. oh. he's, a, he's one of the exceptions. He's one of the good boys. He's not one of the crazies from down there. Oh. And there are plenty, right, Michael? Crazies on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're trying to impeach our attorney general. He should probably have been kicked out of office many years ago, I guess. Yeah, and that's, I saw that. And then, and then they only meet legislative two years, every two years. But they're worrying about the most ignorant, well, some of the things that you appear not to really worry about. And we have a, a major surplus, which they want to spend money, but they're more interested by doing all this other stuff. And you supposed said it to, to me. Yeah, it's supposed to end today, unless they call a special session. Who knows? God give them all peace and patience. Okay. If everybody will be so kind, to put themselves on mute, we'll begin with our evening prayer. And since we are going to be talking about the Feast of Pentecost and we're in the season of Pentecost, um, I wish to read and pray the fifth verse of the prayer of St. Nessa Shnorali that we normally do or customarily do during Lent. So if you'll join me in prayer. Anonhoria wa tvoya wa principo amen. Hokia sozo asvajish marit vor ichar portanan ye verna dono ye lusavore tsirzis magergotiap sub avazanin. Megan chetsi ye rinkitem ye ku archevet. Makrezis dead verestin asvajainko. Gragov, ich bes ma kretsid arakel nera. Grage le zunerov. Ye borme ku ararazat nerut. Ye vitz pasma meritz. Spirit of God, true God, who descended in the river Jordan and in the upper chamber and did illumine me by the baptism of the holy font. I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. Cleanse me again with thy divine fire, as thou did purify with fiery tongues the holy apostles, and have mercy upon thy creatures and upon me, a great sinner. Amen. Okay. Everybody is well? I yes. hope. Everybody's yeah. good. Everybody's yeah. good, smiling, <laughs> happy, content, all that good stuff. William, I don't see you smiling. Where's the smile, man? All right, that's better. That's better. Okay, again, if everybody will be kind enough to put themselves on mute, we oh. can begin our evening session. So, my computer now doesn't want to come. Here we go. Okay. So tonight we're going to be talking about the Feast of Pentecost. And as we, and as I start this narrative of Pentecost, as you listen, as you hear the passages and so forth, I'm sure that it's going to raise within your mind certain questions. And as I go over the text, the words of the text, what I want you to concentrate on is the essence of its message the essence of its message, and I want you to meditate on the meaning of what is being said. Let it 
roll around in your mind a little bit. Uh, in Armenian, we say, let it cook a little bit up in the, in the uh, upper regions. So to help me find understanding in what I want to present this evening, I reviewed a few reference materials that I have. I used a catechism of instruction that was translated from the original French and published by St. Vladimir Seminary in 1966. And this book is called The Living God, and it was published in two volumes. This is the one volume. And the other, the other source was a catechism, our own catechism of Christian instructions according to the doctrine of the Armenian church. Um, and it's a small little publication, and this is what it is here. This work was originally published in the early 19th century and later revised by Archbishop Horan Narbe and was later translated by Father Pizag Hayrabet Hagop in Calcutta, India in 1898. Um, and we've had a presence, if you don't know, in, in the Far East. Uh, for many, many centuries. I know that our people from Australia know this very, very well. <laughs> In fact, if I'm not mistaken, not too long ago, Haiga uh, Zunsipazan uh, visited the communities in the Far East. Now, the last, public, the last publication that I spoke about, um, the, the last revision was done in 1955 at the Monastery of St. James in Jerusalem which at the time was under the leadership of Archbishop Diran Nesoyan, who was the patriarch elect. Uh, I say patriarch elect because uh, within our churches, other churches, things take place that aren't very, very honorable. And Diran Setpazan being the properly elected, legitimately elected, legally elected patriarch was very unceremoniously uh, exiled from Jerusalem by his rival, Archbishop Yerisha Dederian, who became the sitting patriarch. Um, at the time, Jerusalem was under the mandate of the Jordanian government. And so Archbishop Dederian went to the Jordanians and said that this Archbishop Diran is a communist sympathizer. Well, in the 1950s, it wasn't very cool to be a communist sympathizer. So as Vidan Serpazan was in procession on his way to enter into the Cathedral of St. James, he was very unceremoniously taken away, put into an automobile, and they took him to the airport, put him on a plane, and sent him to London. And when the Brotherhood in Jerusalem reconvened, Archbishop Dederian was elected to be the patriarch. But Archbishop Diran Nesoyan lived a life that was full and thank God in one way what happened to him happened to him because he was the man who started the ACYOA. He was the man who started St. Nessus Armenian Seminary. He is the man who not only started the seminary but taught at the seminary. Um, very inspirational. Um, he started the choir association in our, in our diocese. So Archbishop Diran Esorian is a man that we give thanks to God for because at his time and for many decades later, he was the premier theologian of our church. And this diocese and the rest of the church benefited from him uh, for many years. But anyways, okay. Um, the catechism, like I said, he revised it while he was the patriarchal in, in Jerusalem. The language is a little bit dated in part, um, but the basic teachings of our faith, the basic teachings of our church contained within these pages, shall we say, are solid. What you find in this little book is what we believe, what we proclaim, and what we are to practice, practice as the faithful of the Armenian church. Now, a catechism is a book of instruction in the form of a series of questions and answer. It's a summary or an exposition of doctrine, and it serves as a learning introduction to the sacraments and teachings of the church. 
I want to give you a little example of our catechism. Talking about the church itself. The question is, how many churches did Christ found? Christ founded only one church through his apostles. And with them he promised to be unto the end of the world. Therefore, whoever is outside the church, he is not in Christ. You can see the language is a little bit, like I said, dated. Are all men who bear the name Christians in the church? Human error separated from the church of Christ, certain men in societies who, although they claim the name of Christian, yet their faith and discipline being not in accordance with the doctrine of Christ and his apostles are not true church are not are not true church of christ now we would word that a little bit differently uh, we would probably say no right at the beginning of, of, of this explanation but again you can hear uh in a i don't know if any of you knew archbishop did on uh Nesoyan, but uh, uh as i read this i can hear his voice in my ear i was blessed to have him as <laughs> One of my instructors at St. Nurses. says, by what is the Church of Christ known? The Church of Christ must have the distinguishing notes or qualities defined by the creed of the Ecumenical Council of Constantinople, which notes are that it is one, holy, Catholic, or universal, and apostolic. Therefore, the Holy Church of Armenia daily prays to God for the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So this is just an example of the way this catechism uh, is, is presented. So now for today, I want to look at the text that talk about uh, the Pe Pentecost. And I want to first look at chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. But I'm going to read this to you. And like I said, try to hear the essence of what is being presented by Luke. So, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them. And a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was be bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Figria, Figria and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. So, what did I learn that I hope to impart on you from the instructions from the catechisms that I just went over? Why did the Holy Spirit take the form of tongues of fire? Well, in the Eastern Orthodox Catechism, I found the following. The tongue is the instrument of speech. The tongue of fire represents God's tongue. The disciple upon whom it rests will proclaim the word of God. After the descent of the Holy Spirit, each apostle became a bearer of the word of God. That is why Peter immediately began to proclaim the resurrection of Christ and the others told of the mighty works of God. 
we can ask, why is it written that tongues were distributed and resting on each one of them? The gift of the Holy Spirit is personal. It was received individually by each one of the disciples. And yet there is only one Holy Spirit. This divine fire descends upon all. But it is divided to show that each one individually receives the Holy Spirit. So now, if you can recall in your Sunday school days, Mr. Brewster and Marsha, you two especially, the account of the Tower of Babel, we read in Genesis chapter 11. You remember about the Tower of Babel. After the flood, the people of the earth had one language and few words. And the people came together and they decided to build this great tower with its top reaching up to heavens. Now in the book of Exodus, it says, now the whole earth had one language, excuse me, Genesis. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and fire them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and butamen for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. But the Lord said, come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad and there over the face of all the earth. And they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. What happened at Pentecost is the exact opposite of what happened at Babel. At Babel, human tongues were divided through pride so that men no longer understood each other and were separated and dispersed. At Pentecost, it is the gift of God, with tongues of fire, which divides itself so that it may descend upon each one individually and reunite them all. All those who have received the Holy Spirit proclaim the same word, the word of God. They are understood by all because they all speak because they speak all languages. All language barriers are broken by the word of God. It is understood by all those who have received the gift of languages. Another question. Why did the tongues of fire descend only upon the disciples and not everyone that was there? Because they descended upon those whom Jesus had prepared to receive the Holy Spirit. On those whose Hearts were united through faith in the risen Lord Jesus. One must believe in the giver to receive the gift. Let that sink in. The Spirit did not descend on the world because the world cannot receive him because it neither sees him nor knows him. We find that in John Chapter 14, verses 17. The Holy Spirit descended on those whom the Lord Jesus had brought together because they believed in him. He descended upon the church. What was the church? Ecclesia, Yegeretsi, the gathered faithful. Not the building. The church is Yegeretsi. We call that Yegeretsi, but that's a misnomer. The church are those individuals who come together with the one faith. Remember I read from what Archbishop Nadebe wrote? How many churches did Christ found? 
Christ founded only one church through his apostles. And with them he promised to be unto the end of the world. Therefore, whoever is outside the church, he is not in Christ. So at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon the church, the believers. The Holy Spirit is a personal gift, which each one receives individually, but at a time when everyone is assembled together. Acts chapter 2 verse 1 states that when the Pen day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. They were in the upper room. You know what the upper room is? You should. The place of the Last Supper. The upper room is the place of the Last Supper. That's where they gather with Christ. And so that's where they gathered. And there... Suddenly, they underwent a radical change. They became conscious of the word of God within themselves. And they began to proclaim his wonders in various and all different kinds of languages. And it's at this point that Peter courageously preached the resurrection of the crucified one to those who crucified him. When we look at Peter's address... It says, starting in verse 14, but Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Now, don't forget, the people that heard the apostles speak in different languages thought they were filled with new wine. In other words, they were drunk. And Peter says, indeed. These are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And he quotes the prophet Joel. In the last days, it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Prophet Job. Now, Peter explains the reason for this beautifully worded speech. He said, it is not that the speakers are drunk because it's only, as I said, the third hour, nine o'clock in the morning, and nobody is intoxicated at that early. Uh, intoxicated that early. Instead, the words of the prophet Joel are being fulfilled. The spirit has been poured out and the day of the Lord has come. For in the time of the prophet Joel, of course, we know the Lord was God, the God of Abraham, and the day was the end. But for the, God, for the writer of Acts, Luke, the Lord is Jesus, and the day is the time of preaching. Now, Peter goes on, and he says, fellow Israelites, Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth. A man attested to you by God with the deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you. As you yourself know, this man handed over to you according to the defi defined plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up having released him from the agony of death because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. 
By his death, he trampled down death. We've seen this at Easter and 40 days after. He goes on, he says, but David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life, and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Peter says, fellow Israelites, I may say to you confident, uh, confidently of our ancestor David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. For seeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. I spoke to you about the icon of the descent into Hades a few times, a number of times. Remember I said that Jesus was standing on the cross doors, the gates, the gates of hell. And in his right hand and his left hand, he was holding an old man and an old woman, Adam and Eve. Because from the time of Adam and Eve, mankind was held captive in Hades by death. Death was the ultimate sin that was caused by the disobedience of Adam and Eve in the garden. And so all the souls from the time of Adam and Eve, the kings, the prophets, and so forth, the people of Israel, they're all held captive. But by the death and resurrection of Christ, these souls have all been freed. He has trampled down death by his death, and by his resurrection, they are resurrected. Peter goes on, he says, this Jesus God's raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. All of us are witnesses. Remember, this is Peter who denied Jesus three times. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, remember we talked about this for ascension. When we look at the Nicene Creed, we see that Christ ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God. It takes with him our our humanity being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you see and hear. But David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah. And then Peter finishes by saying, this Jesus whom you crucified. Whom you crucified. Getting pretty heavy, huh? So now, we read, now when they heard this, the people that were there listening, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, brother, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Ah. Oh came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. 
all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Okay. Quite a bit. Quite a bit. We see starting at verse 37 to 47, the crowds responding with the chorus saying, what shall we do? They evidently believed in what Peter was saying. Remember, this is the first century Christian community, the people coming together. So Peter speaks to them and he demands two things. Repentance, baptism. These were already linked by John the Baptist. We know that. We know what John the Baptist said in the early parts of the Gospels. But Luke adds the gift of the Holy Spirit. Luke seems to support a doctrine of baptismal regeneration and to present baptism as a prerequisite for receiving the Holy Spirit of God. Don't forget, at this time, we're talking about adult baptism. There was no infant baptism at this time. Luke is presenting here an order of admission into the Christian community. You may remember that I spoke, of you, spoke to you about the early Christian doctrine called the Didache. It was a manual of church instruction. Um, it was written around 70, 80, 90 AD. They're not, uh, they're not too sure exactly when, but it's one of the earliest documents that we have concerning the early Christian community. It falls into two parts, this document called the Didache. The first is a code of Christian morals presented as a choice between the way of life and the way of death. And the second part is a manual of church order, which in a well-arranged manner lays down some simple, at times even naive rules for the conduct of a rural congregation. And it deals with such topics as baptism, fasting, the Lord's Supper, uh, itinerant prophets and the local ministry of bishops and deacons and its instructions are like the catechisms that I refer to with the questions and the instructions afterwards okay um, this is what it says about baptism and it says now about baptism this is how to baptize it's wonderful when you get an instruction manual that says, this is what you're going to do. This is how to do it. Give public instruction on all these points and then baptize in running water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If you do not have running water, baptize in some other. If you cannot in cold, then in warm. If you have neither, then pour water on the head three times in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Before the baptism, moreover, the one who baptizes and the one being baptized must fast. The one who baptizes and the one being baptized must fast, and any others who can. And you must tell the one being baptized to fast for one or two days beforehand. Tells you how to baptize. Now, what is the most important part of this document regarding baptism? This is how you baptize. And how is it that we baptize? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why is that important, especially to us as an Orthodox Christian? Well, not all communities who call themselves Christians do that. There are many Protestant communities, Pentecostals, for example, 
who will declare, I baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. Or how a minister feels at that time, because I've spoken to some ministers from these um, uh, street corner mission churches, uh, Bible function, Bible churches and so forth that have no connection to any other church or community. And I would ask them, when you baptize, what is the formula that you use? And many times I was told, well, as I feel, be, as I am moved, that's how I baptize. Uh, guess what? No. From the earliest of times, unless a baptism is to be considered valid, it must be, it must be proclaimed in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's why sometimes we don't recognize these other communities as being actually a part of the Christian community. Um, they are off by themselves setting their own uh, governing examples. But as you see from the earliest of time, from the time of the apostolic community, there were instructions in that very important sacrament that is of baptism. Now, let's go back to the text. The promise of forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit is universal. It is granted to those of later generations and distant places. In response to this exhortation to salvation, 3,000 people are baptized and added to the church, as we read. Now, of course, this number would present difficulties in administering and probably is no doubt idealized. But what that 3,000 would re represent is, like I said, that mystical number 40, the number seven, a great many. A lot of people came and baptized, were baptized. How many hungry people did Jesus field, uh, feed with two loaves and five fishes? 5,000. Okay, well, who is there counting? We don't know. You look and you say, well, there's about 5,000 people. Like a lot of people. And that's the message that Luke is trying to give us today. Now, following all this, we have the summaries of life in the community. Then we have the outlines of religious life of the believers, what they believed in, and what did it say? They, they shared day by day. Awe came upon everyone, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed, that's us, were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as had need. Day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread. In other words, they had badarak at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Okay. The breaking of bread observed in their homes is the distinctive feature of early Christian worship, Badarak, the Eucharist. Although it involved a full meal, the breaking of bread is Luke's terminology for the Lord's Supper. The Supper perhaps took on sacramental ideals in the churches of St. Paul. Because the distinctive character of the early, church, uh, early Jerusalem practice is a partaking with a glad and generous heart and an observance day by day. Other acts we see of worship and including prayer at home and in the temple and the fellowship of involving a sharing of possessions. Uh, but this idea of coming together to share that meal. If you were in Armenia and somebody wanted to invite you to their home for, for an evening meal or for a meal, um, they would say, Let's, let's share a little bread. Uh, we have in our country, I don't know about Australia, uh, we're going to have dinner. Why don't you come about 7 o'clock and we'll eat at 7.30? Mm. 
over there, Yegek. It's an all day, all day ordeal. It's a sharing, it's a giving of what you have to the other. Uh, we have a word in Armenian, Anger. Anger means that sense of eating with somebody very, very close, somebody that you feel very, very close with, more so than Parigam, a friend. Anger is that person who is special that you share food together, you sit and you eat together. That's how important it is. This breaking of bread was the fullness of Jesus Christ found in the Eucharistic meal. And it was so important to that early Christian community as it is, should be for us today. That idea of coming together for the celebration of Badarak, that sharing, that asking for forgiveness, that offering of repentance. And so that's what the essence, the word I used right in the beginning of when I was going to speak, of what this passage on Pentecost is speaking of. You see, Pentecost is still with us today. The Holy Spirit has, continu has been continuously present since that time, coming down to consecrate those who bear witness to the resurrection of Christ. And he will be with us to the end of time. We receive the Holy Spirit through our baptism and confirmation. We become a part of the church. Am I already show the idea of building? Yeah, we're one of those fingers, one of those bricks in that wall of the church, the structure of the church. Baptism allows us to become Christians. Confirmation has us becoming a part of the church. And in our case, an Armenian Orthodox Christian. We do this after our renunciation of Satan, our statement of faith, we believe, the cleansing of evil from us, the prayers of the priest, the exorcism, which is done, and we do an exorcism at every baptism. You may not realize that, but it's not like what you see in the movie, The Exorcist. But Exorcism means it's a offering of prayers against the evil one. The priest at the beginning of celebrating Badarak on a Sunday before the morning service offers the renunciation of Satan. He faces the west, faces the door. Haraja, he raises his hand in rejection. I reject Satan and all his evils, all his disciples and so forth. And then he turns and he faces the altar, faces the east, and he offers the creed of St. Gregory of Nare, Adate, excuse me. So there is this cleansing of our soul and then our baptism. And with our confirmation, we are now granted the privilege, privilege to receive the sacraments. That's why Holy Communion is offered to the newly baptized. I want you to think of your life within your parish community. I ask you to do this to make what we are discussing here, what I'm discussing and you're listening to, I hope, become real. We cannot look at the uh, uh, the events of, of Pentecost and say, what a nice story that was. That I thank you for, say, for sharing that story with us. We need to connect with what happened at Pentecost. Connect is that word that I use a lot too, like essence. Because if you're not connected, you're on the outside. You take an electrical plug and you put it into the socket. Unless that connection is made, there's no power. There's no juice coming through that power cord to whatever device you're using. And we need to connect to the events of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that gives animation. Obviously, what we read of Peter's serum is impressive. I don't know if any of you have heard, ever heard anyone speak or preach like what we find in the words of Peter. He said to his listeners, therefore let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, and then he goes on to say, this Jesus whom you crucified. 
Imagine if the priest gets up in your parish and says to the congregation something like that. Hook you. So God is suggesting to you, as you listen to the words of Peter's sermon, something. He's saying something to you. See, he's suggesting something to you. What is it that you think God is saying to you at this time? Through the words of Peter that we read, and if you have your Bibles in front of you, look and read again what some of the words of Peter were. Um, do you have the courage? Do you have the courage to stand as Peter did and say to your parish community what Peter was saying? Or maybe suggest to your pastor to preach what Peter said to the entire community. Another question I'm asking you to think about. Has the sacrament of baptism and confirmation taken on a more significant meaning for you after hearing this as perhaps a parent, grandparent, or especially as a godparent? And if we look at the last part of the passage, it says, awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and good and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and they ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. Have you ever felt that awe within your church community, during Badarak, doing activities for, for God, sharing your possessions? Have you ever invited your neighbors to break bread, as was meant by the passage that we read. So it is at here at this point that I will, like the three Gabiks, see no evil, you know, I will stop. And I am coming to you. And I've given you an awful lot to think about and a lot of questions to answer. And so I turn it over to you. Tell me your thoughts. Tell me the answers to some of my questions. I agree. I disagree. However, who's willing? Raise your hand. Linda. I have, Linda. A, question. I have a question, actually. And I got to think? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so ahead, when you said... Um, I have a note here. You said that um, God, uh, Jesus was, was resurrected, died and he was resurrected, and he took our humanity, I'm putting it in quotes, took our humanity with him. What does it mean he took our humanity? Uh, good question. I was confusing a little bit of what I spoke at Bible study to a sermon that I preached about it. If we so look I, guess, I guess I thought that we, we think of Jesus as being perfect God, perfect man. Right. To me means that he already has humanity. Yeah, what do you mean he always ha he has humanity? He has humanity. He is part human. Oh, so, da, da, da. Okay. Always remember what I say to you and admonish you. Be <laughs> careful of the word you use. Part human? No, he, he was human and he was divine. Yes. Right. Totally, yeah. totally human. And totally divine. Totally divine. So, so we look go at... Ahead. Go ahead. So when he takes our humanity with him... Yes. What is he exactly is he doing? Okay. In the Nicene Creed, we read, who for us men and for our salvation 
came down from heaven, we're speaking of Jesus Christ, right? Right. God came, God came down from heaven, was incarnate, was made man, yeah. was born perfectly of the Holy Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit, okay? By whom he took body, soul, and mind, and everything that is in man, truly, and not in semblance. In other words, he wasn't faking it. It wasn't just an act. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? Yes. Christ came down, was incarnate. He took upon himself all of humanity. Mm -hmm. All of what you and I are made of, he took upon himself. That never left him. He was totally man, totally God at the same time while on earth. Okay? Okay. okay. He suffered and was crucified and was buried and rose on, again on the third day. Agree? And ascended into heaven with the same body and sat at the right hand of the Father. Now, what am I referring to when I say the same body? The body that contained the divinity of God and the humanness of mankind ascended and sat at the right hand of God. The humanity, our humanity, sits now with God at his right hand. Okay. Our humanity, the humanity that we share with him. The humanity that God took upon himself. While they were gazing at the heaven as he went, behold, okay. Blah, 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 blah. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or season which the father has fixed on his own authority. But you shall, <coughs> this is in the beginning of Acts, but you shall receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. And when he had said this, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Christ assumed upon himself, took upon himself humanity, mankind, everything that we are, truly and not in semblance, everything that we are, what we felt. Christ hanging on the cross felt the pain that you and I would feel hanging on the cross. It wasn't okay. an act. Okay. And when he resurrected from the dead, humanity also resurrected from the dead. I spoke of that icon holding Jesus holding the hands of Adam and Eve, okay? We are no longer captive. But we have been re, we have been resurrected because of Jesus. By his death, he trampled down death. And so humanity has resurrected from the death, from death. Death no longer has any hold. And Jesus, who contains both the divinity and the humanity, ascended into heaven. He takes with himself, our humanity as well. The humanity wasn't left behind. Ah. Am, I, am I explaining that in a way that it's understood? Okay, so the so humanity the, the, that he possessed, we'll say, while he was on earth as an infant, as a young child, as an as a adult in his teaching ministry, from the time that Christ assumed the, from the birth of, 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 of the Virgin Mary, our humanity, he takes that same humanity with him at the right hand of the Father. And so we sit as mankind at the right hand of the Father as well. It's pretty deep. It's called theology, yeah. That's what we, we believe. We <laughs> believe. Remember, Linda, we say at the beginning of all this, Havadam, we believe. This is what we believe. Well, when you use the terminology that he took the humanity, it sounds like 
he, I guess it's the word took that's confusing. It sounds like he's um, taking, well, yes or no, he's taking us with him? He took humanity with him. Okay. He took human. Christ assumed our humanity upon himself when he was born of the virgin, correct? Yes. Yes, because we say that in the Havada. But I thought it was God that gave him humanity. I thought that God gave him humanity. Through the no? birth of the virgin, he the Holy Spirit came upon the Virgin Mary. And through that birth, he assumed that humanity because he was born of the Virgin Mary. Okay. When I speak of what we believe in is the as the Havadam. And I think I've said this many times. We have to be very careful on the words that we use. When we say we believe, we must believe. Otherwise, what's the sense? Words. What's Words. the sense? So when we, we and, it, and it does, it behooves each of us that we should review the words of the Havadam, the words of St. Gregory of Dathe, the creed that he wrote, the baptismal creed. What is it that we believe? That if any of you have ever been a godparent, you're speaking on behalf of that child. You are proclaiming on behalf of that child your faith for him or her. And this is what it's all about. If you don't believe, have a nice day. You know. <laughs> This is what, that's why words are very careful, okay, are very important, okay? And it's very difficult that when works that have been written in, we'll say, classical Greek are translated, they have to be translated meticulously. That's why we have divisions in our churches. That's why we have the Oriental Orthodox, which we are, and the Eastern Orthodox, like the Greeks, because we were arguing, and we still argue, over the meaning of one letter, not my one word, but one one letter that was within a word that made the understanding of the word a little a little different. Do we believe in one nature, two persons, or do we believe in one person with two natures? That's what separates the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox. That's why words are very important. So when we say certain things, and when we're discussing certain things, we have to be very, very careful of what words we use. By whom he took body, soul, and mind, and everything that is in man. What else is left? We have a body, soul, we have a mind, and everything that's, that we have, Christ assumed upon himself. Now, if there are parts of that that you're difficult to understand, which is understandable, you have to stop and think about it. You have to stop and think about it. What, what is it again? Well, let me see. Instead of just thinking, why don't I go to St. John Chrysostom, one of the church fathers, and see what he says about it. Or go to this source, or go to that source. That's why when I prepared for tonight, I went to these Two different sources. Who the heck am I to preach to you about Pentecost? I'm giving to you some of what I know, as little as that is, and what people far more intelligent than I are saying. That's what you need to hear, because one of the worst things that a priest can do is give you wrong information. Because now you have to unlearn that. Well, dead Tatio said, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, well, dead Tatio wasn't correct in what he said to you. Well, wait a minute. I like that, Tatios. What are you saying about that? Yeah. <laughs> I said, but, I think I gave you Father, the Go ahead. But does it mean that because he assumed the same humanity that we have, does that mean that we're fully capable of everything that Jesus was capable yes, of? Yes, 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 yes. And you know how but we, we know can't... that? You mm -hmm. know how, how we know that? Through the sacrament of Holy Communion. When we receive Holy Communion, and I've said this many times, when we confess our sins, okay, when we repent, I am truly sorry, we repent, we confess our sins, we want to be made clean. Clean in that sense that all of the stain of sin has been removed from us. 
and we come and we approach the celebrant and the chalice that contains the body and blood of Christ with that sense of cleansing. And we receive within our bodies the body and blood of Christ. This is the body and blood. Not a representation, not a fact. This is. This is. And the responder, Havadam, I, I believe. And so you receive that. And at that point, you and Christ are one. And when is it that we no longer are one? When we sin again and we turn away from God. That's what sin is, turning away from God. And we enter into that realm of death because sin is equated to death. We, de we die to the life that Christ gives to us. Something uh, to think about, huh? Thank you for that. You're welcome, my dear. <laughs> I hope I didn't, you didn't really confuse me. No. give too much stuff that's going to weigh down on your minds and stuff. But what's important to do is to dwell into the essence of what Pentecost is all about. We receive our Pentecost to that confirmation. We have the same Holy Spirit within us, as St. Paul says, our hearts are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. We have the same abilities as the apostles to heal. We have the same ability as St. Peter to preach. And how is it that we have that? Well, we need to also put our time into study, to pray, to enter into that whole life, that whole understanding. As much as I can explain to you about how to swim, what's the first thing you're going to do to learn how to swim? Get in the water. I can talk to you all I want about Badarak, but if you don't attend Badarak, if you don't understand what Badarak is, I'm talking, you know, in the clouds. You have to become a part of it. You want to talk about love. How do you talk about, you have to experience love. Oh, it's wonderful to be in love and I love my, my spouse, Yavai and Yavai. But unless there's that love of a mother and father, unless there's a love of uh, a parent to children, uh, a, a love of, of God, whatever it is, Unless that's experienced, you don't understand what love is. I gave you the words of Hovanes uh, Bulus. Aslad said it. God is love. You want to know what God is? You have to know what love is. Because God is love. Total love. God gave his only begotten son. Why? Because he loved us. Right? John 3.16. Go to a football game, you see the signs, John 3.16, right? Everybody's holding up John 3.16. <laughs> yeah. Read John 3.16, folks. No one might just hold up signs, all right? That's what it's all about. That's the essence. The words are one thing, but the essence of what is being said. And the understanding of that privilege that we have of being given blessed with the Holy Spirit, that tongues of fire. Maybe a tongue of fire doesn't come on top of our head, but that sense of the Holy Spirit, the priest anoints you, forehead, eyes, nose, mouth, ears, heart, back, hand, feet, totally. You are covered with the Holy Muron. Holy Muron, symbolic of the Holy Spirit of God. You are that apostle that is receiving the Holy Spirit of Pentecost. This is your Pentecost. So I say to all of you, take the time before the next time you go to Badarak, and don't wait longer than next Sunday. Open up your Badarak book. Hopefully you all have a copy of the Badarak. And if you don't have a copy of the Badarak, you can get one online. They're all, it's available. And read the words of the Nicene Creed. And the first word is we. we. In the Roman Catholic Church, they say, I believe. We don't. We say we because 
we are part of the community. The community that I spoke about, the St. Peter spoke about, we believe. And ask yourself, do I? And do I what? Do I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and so on and so forth, and in one Lord Jesus Christ? Take a step by step. Take one part of that each week if you want. I don't care. But at least walk that journey to have that understanding. Otherwise, you know, you could be in the choir. Who cares? You can be the Sarga Vox up there. And, you know, if you happen to be from Bolis, given that Allah Turka, you know, Yehana that they sing, um, coming out in Who cares? What are you doing? What are you saying? What do you believe? Do you believe? And if you don't, have a nice day. Go to the beach instead. You get just as much accomplished. But I urge you, I urge you, start with that. You want an understanding of what it is, who it is that you are, what it is that you are, what it is that you are to be. Start with the Nicene Creed. Use the references. You see all the references from the book of, of, of Acts in the Creed, in Genesis, God of God, light of light. Where did light come from? Who is God? Where did Christ come from? Everything is there. So I said I wasn't going to talk too much, and I did. I talked too much. Any other, I, could, any I, could I say something? Can you hear sure. me? I, sure. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <clears throat> this is the first time that I have read Acts in detail. I've done a lot of other. Um, but the one thing, a couple of things that strike me about Luke is that he was, a, first of all, he was a very educated man. Mm -hmm. Another point that I found out about this, um, the, him writing Acts, is that he was a very educated person. So that's why we find these kind of, you know, the parallels and the references that go back to Joel. I, I don't think that, you know, I've read a lot uh, in the New Testament that has these specific references that go back to certain books of the Old Testament. And I, I give... Uh, Luke a lot of respect for that but the fact well, that Luke it, Luke recorded this he's like he's like the journalist who is taking notes and I so I checked in the back of my um my um study bible and there are several references to the Pentecost that go back Luke wasn't the only one who did it um right. it's in Ezekiel um it looks like Leviticus and some of these others so I well, love Pentecost was a Jewish holiday, don't forget. Yes, the Feast of Feasts, right. So It's so a harvest it was, feast. It was right. a harvest feast that occurred 50 days after, after Passover. And the other thing about Luke is that he accompanied Paul on his missionary journeys. Because we've got these 3,000 who were there present at that moment. And then they dispersed with all their languages and they that's when... Paul started on his missionary journeys. But don't um, forget one thing that understand that Luke uh, was Greek, was a Greek. He was not Jewish. And so when you look at his gospel and even in the uh, book of Acts, when he's explaining things, he goes into minute details yes. because of the fact that his gospel was being preached basically to the non-Jew. Matthew's gospel was created for the Jew. And an example that I always give um, for instance, on the Feast of Passover. Now, if you were a Jew, you would know what Passover was. If you were not a Jew, as in Luke's case, he would explain on the Feast of Passover, which was the day that this was done and that was done, so that the Greeks, the non-Jew, and we refer to them as the Greeks, the, the, the Odads from the Jewish community, they would understand. So Luke is always going into detail. So when you talk about <laughs> Uh, Joel and so forth and other Old Testament references understand that the, the the audience that Luke had had no idea of these Old Testament prophets because they were not Jewish. But the Jews themselves would know what was written in the Psalms, what was written in the prophets, and so on and so forth. So always always keep that in mind when we are talking about Luke's gospel and the and the book of uh, Acts is that. His was written for the Gentile community more so than the Jewish community. 
Well, I also read that there's been some scholarly debate about whether he might have been a Hellenized Jew. And I think that comes from, but most of the, most of the sources that I checked with believe that he was a Greek. What other sources you're using? Um, That's important. Well, I I it's I got a whole stack of books here. So uh, okay. you know, just in general, I was just kind of looking okay. for a sprinkling of okay. you know who's who and what's what. But my my suggestion, my my suggestion, and it's always been my suggestion, is that you go back as early as you can to find the sources um, as to what is being written and what is being explained to you. Yes. Um, and, and if you look at some of the material that the Oxford Study Bible people put out, it's very, very good. Um, you want to go back as early as you can to those genuine sources. Now, of course, a lot of study has been done since the time of, we'll say, the, the fourth century, fifth century. But you have to be careful in that there always must be an understanding that is it an individual who is saying, I found that this is what it is, rather than, as I said, with the Orthodox Study Bible, there was a committee of various scholars coming together and creating the words of explanation and so forth. Yes. Um, there are many good modern day scholars that are out there, no question about it. But I, like I always say, make sure you check your sources uh, thoroughly so that you know exactly what is being taught to you. The conclusion that I come to, though, is that whether he, whatever he was, he was very educated. He had read, if he wasn't a Jew, he had read the Old Testament. He had read all of those books. So he could, as you said, uh, it's logical. He, he wanted to communicate with Jews and non-Jews. So he knew what he was talking about and he picked those historical events and references that that he could make relate to the point that he was trying to make about also the, also remember this is that through over time there were additions made to many of the new testament books the gospels and the paul and saint paul by individuals who wanted to give credence to what they were putting forth. Right. For instance, in the Gospel of John, scholars have showed that it's actually three different writers, not just one right, person right, named John. Right, right. So, so what, what I'm saying, I'm not disputing anything you're saying, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, in my case, in your case, and everybody else's case, if you want to know what is actual, you have to go to more than one source to find out. And the best sources for us as Armenian Christians is, uh, is our Orthodox Church Fathers. Uh, right. They're the and ones. They, they, it seems that they all um, come to one conclusion mm -hmm. that uh, everything that's in uh, Acts, everything that's written by Luke is historically accurate. For the there's, most part, it is. The other yeah. ones are, are as, you, as you said, kind of fuzzy. But, yeah, for um, the most part, it is. For the most part, it is. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the one final point is that um, to your knowledge, was Luke present with Paul when he was executed? He was there. He was there in Rome. Right. So several sources say that, and I haven't. I haven't really looked into. I, my... I don't. I don't remember reading of any definitive source that said yes, he was. Okay. There again, it, 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 it's this, you know, point where we we're not a hundred percent certain. Logically, maybe yes, um, but 100% certain, we don't know. But I just finally want to say that this discussion, and I, I read all of this. I did my homework before. Good I girl. Out. I'm happy. You may listen to that. She, read, she did her homework. <laughs> I'm yeah. a teacher, so that's what we Labris, have to do. Labris, good girl. And this gave me a completely different understanding, of, like a full understanding of the Pentecost. Good. You know, I knew the basics because I've taught it to second graders. But this gives me like a grown up understanding of- Wonderful, I'm so happy. Thank you for that, thank you. Anyone else? Anybody else? Any comments, questions? No then, I speak too much. Nothing else? What's okay. next? The next 
we're going to start next. We're going to do another one next week and get back on our first and third schedule. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I am going to be doing the seven I am's of Jesus that we find in the gospel of John. And I will be sending that out with my Sunday bulletin. What's today? Wednesday? Is Wednesday? Thursday? Yes. Yeah. Wednesday. 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 Okay. So I'll be sending it out either tomorrow or Friday. No, not tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to the beach. Don't look for me tomorrow. I'm going to be at the beach. As they say, I'm going to be that beach whale sitting there like this. Oh, hunkies. <laughs> anyway, so Friday I'll send it out. Uh, and it'll be the seven I am's of Jesus that we will find uh, in the gospel of John. And I will reference the seven so that you'll have that. And you'll be able to look it up. And that we'll be doing for the next two sessions because I got the seven of them. So we'll do, we'll divide it up. Okay. So if you want a head start, you can start doing it. <laughs> there will be okay. a test. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, <laughs> ladies you. and gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. God bless. Okay. Thank you, Michael. As always, you're the best, man. More than welcome. I'll send it to you right away. Don't hurry, I'm not going to send it till Friday. <laughs> <laughs>